you might find it's kind of difficult to walk around and not see someone on a mobile device or some type of device that's attached to them or around them whenever you're out and about. The majority of, them, of us own some type of computing device or mobile device and even if those people who don't own one, uh, they may, you know, can access them through their libraries, uh, schools, community centers, and definitely at work. The use of computing devices adds much interest, reinforces different skills, and even improves our behaviors. This video will be about today's technologies, a little bit about computers, different devices, as well as using the web. Let's go ahead and take a look at that now. You will see that this term may be new to you. It may seem very broad, but because technology causes us to change and adapt with each new technology, you must keep up with the changes to remain digitally literate. Digital literacy involves having a current knowledge and understanding of computers, mobile devices, the internet, and various related technologies. The creator of VisiCalc, Dan Bricklin, who created the first successful spreadsheet program because he didn't want to have to do things by hand and calculators were just ridiculous, he emphasized that digital literacy implies a general knowledge of computers. When he said that, what does it mean to be computer literate? It does not mean knowing how to use a particular program, it means knowing how to use a computer. So, as an individual, you know, being car literate doesn't mean you know how to drive the particular car that you learned on. It means that you can apply that information to drive pretty much any vehicle. In our being digital literate, we need to be able to adapt to different technologies, and, and keeping up with current technologies helps us make that change much easier. But we should understand how they work. Now a computer in general is just an electronic device that's operating under the control of basic instructions that have been provided to it and stored in its own memory. And that computer can accept data or what's known as input. Then it can process that data according to whatever specified rules based on the programs are there. And then produce some type of information, some type of output to the user. A computer can also store the information for future use. Computers contain many electric, electronic and mechanical components known as the hardware. A user of these computing devices is generally anyone who interacts with a computer or a mobile device or utilizes the information that's been generated through this input process output. You hear the term PC or personal computer. And all this means is it is a computer that can perform all of its input, all of the processing, all the output, and the storage activities solely on its own, and it's intended to be used by a single or even multiple person at a time. It depends on the situation, but typically it can only be used by one person at a time. Now a mobile computer, I use that term too, is a portable personal computer. When you grab your phone or your tablet or whatever, these are computers. They're designed the same way. They have the, the intricities of our standalone computers. But these pr mobile computers, they're designed so that we can carry it from place to place and use them when needed, whether connected or not connected to the internet. Uh, you're probably very familiar with uh, some of these devices here. You can see in the top left we've got a phone, a smartphone being used to connect to the internet using lots of applications. Top right, we've got a typical laptop there that we can sit down. It's mobile. We can take it wherever we need. It's got a keyboard. And then we see there at the bottom where you've got the tablet technology being displayed in which we can still be very productive in what we need to do, very mobile, be connected. But with a general tablet design, we don't have a, a keyboard that's attached to it. We do have the virtual keyboards that you can use on the screen and then if you need, you can have an accessory keyboard in which you can Bluetooth or even dock it to that to be able to use. But the mobile devices do the same thing. All of these are based on the input process output. That 
that same methodology is used. We put information into the computer, it processes, and it gives us the output. That is the basic premise of this. Now, to talk a little bit more about laptops, as I said, this is a mobile computer, and it's, it's designed so that you can take it wherever you need to go to use it. It's also called a notebook. There's another form of laptop that you might hear once in a while, and that's called a netbook. And really all that is for is just connecting to the internet and doing everything online. We're not having applications that are installed onto the computer or the laptop. Um, but a netbook is another term you might come across. And laptops are very widely used, and basically you can break them down into some simple components such as it's got a screen, it could be a touch screen to where you can touch the screen to open or move the mouse or the cursor or open up your applications. It's going to have a keyboard and usually a, a mouse pad there for you to touch and with finger gestures do different uh, things on the computer like a zooming in, uh, scrolling, different things like that. You have a hinge usually that allows you to open and close the lid to protect your screen and when you want to use it. And this also helps keep out dust and particles when it's closed. Now tablets, these are much more mobile, they're much lighter, they're thinner. It's, a, it's really a, just a lightweight mobile computer that almost always has a touch screen. The most popular style of tablets is what's known as the slate tablet. And this does not contain a physical keyboard and you can add a physical keyboard though if you want that attaches to it wirelessly or like you see here on the surface on the right it can be part of the lid or as an accessory really. Here on the left with our iPad there's no keyboard. We do have virtual keybet that's built integrated into it so that we can touch and type. Um, you can also have voice to text as well to be able to just allow you use your voice and then let the operating system interpret what you're saying into it. We can also see with our tablets they run on a much different type of battery power and the more powerful tablets are going to need more powerful batteries. The more you do on that you want an extended battery life for your tablet. And just like our tablets, our laptops run on a battery as well. So if you disconnect the battery and you don't have it plugged in, you're going to lose power and you're going to lose anything you were working on. Um, I talked about touch screens and touch screen gestures a little bit ago. Uh, you know, Some of these include like the tap as a touch screen gesture, the double tap, press and hold, swipe, stretch, pinch. There's lots of different gestures that we can use. The touch screen gesture known as the slide um, that allows you to move an object around on your screen. And we also have the standard desktops and all-in-one computers as well. A desktop or desktop PC or desktop computer is just a personal computer that's designed to be in a stationary location where all of its components fit on or under a desk or table or whatever work surface you have. On many of our desktops the screen is housed in a display device and that's separate from a tower and which a case that contains the processing security so you'll hear the term tower used uh, but we have desktop PCs towers lots of different ways and a tower is going to be upright so that's how you know it's a tower where a desktop one will lay um, on your desk and you can usually people will put their monitors on top of those um, another type of desktop is called an all-in-one and this does not contain any type of separate chassis. This is all of your components are integrated into this. So instead it's going to use that same case or chassis that your display is in and that's where all of your circuitry, all of your components are going to be located. So if, and these make them much more difficult to work on though as an individual and so they're much more intricate in how we take them apart and replace parts when we can. The term desktop, when we use that in IT, the term also sometimes is used to refer to an on-screen work area or desktop. So my screen here is considered my desktop when I'm working on it here for my operating system. 
Another component that you may come across, and you might have just heard the term and not really for sure what all it really is, is a server. And you can see I've got a couple different types of servers here. I've got uh, some blade servers. I've got you know cabinet servers here. So, and then I've got a server cabinet there, so we can protect all these. These are like a lot of working computers. Um, they're much more powerful, and a server is just a computer that's dedicated to providing one or more or multiple services to other computers or devices on a network where all the devices are connected together. Services provided by various servers could include content, uh, controlling access to hardware or software, uh, controlling the network, controlling our email systems. Our servers have a lot of functionality. Some of them are specialized and in t our modern society we're using uh, our virtual servers on these components to be able to expand the functionality of our servers. A lot of times uh, traditionally with servers uh, people will put them in and they'll just run a few things off them so we're not really maximizing the sheer power that these servers are putting out and utilizing all that we've spent money on. So when we use virtual servers we can put all those services where it would traditionally be individual servers onto single devices and then we can mirror those so we have redundancy in case one fails we can automatically you know pull back up and not have an issue and save ourselves a ton of money instead of all of that hardware around using a lot of electricity creating a lot more noise and this will allow us to be able to have a smaller footprint when we are using these but Rack servers, like you see in the top there, and blade servers, as you see on the bottom there, those are the two main types of servers that you might come across. But very powerful computing devices. Mobile and game devices, you see these a lot. Um, the mobile devices here can be categories as computers because they operate under the control of instructions that are stored within their own memory, as I defined earlier. They have the ability to do everything that our traditional desktop computers can do or our laptop. They can accept data, they can process that data um, according to whatever rules and then produce an output or onto your display or even if you're transmitting sound to a speaker it can do that type of output well. We have lots of the same functionality that we have with our desktops or our tablets or even our you know whatever device that you're used to. These mobile devices are very powerful and can do so much more now. You can see like uh, most people have a smartphone and a smartphone is just an internet capable phone that also includes usually like things like calendars, address books, calculators on them, notepads for you to, if you want to create a list and you want to remember it later, you have this digital notepad. Now we can play games on our smartphones. We can use GPS to help navigate us to an, a location. Smartphones are typically going to communicate wirelessly with other devices or computers, usually through Bluetooth. Um, might use NFC near field communication if you're at the gas pump and you want to use your, like Google Pay and you want to pay with your phone rather than using a credit card or whatever you've got the information stored on your device you have to have NFC turned on then you get near the uh, payment center on the on the gas pump it sees your credit card information it's a very close proximity so people aren't gonna be able to steal that you're not gonna be able to drop it and lose it because if you find someone who's lost their smartphone they're usually pretty frantic and with most of our smartphones, uh, most of the models you find, you're also going to be able to listen to music, obviously, take photos and photos and photos and more photos, and then record videos the same way. Uh, most smartphones are going to have a touch screen. Uh, you see that I've also shown on here a digital camera as another one of these mobile game devices. A digital camera is a device that allows you to take photos and store, the, store that photographed image digitally, all in ones and zeros, and then, especially with these smart digital cameras, they have apps on them too. You can upload those to the cloud, send them directly to a printer wirelessly. Lots of options with these smart digital cameras. So you may have a portable media player, and this is just a mobile device in which you can store, organize, and play or view digital media such as music and videos. You know, if you're traveling and you're gonna be on an airplane for a long time, 
you don't want to have to use up your phone you may have one of these tight devices and you can just watch your video on that or listen to your music for you know 10 hours flights whatever the case may be and not affecting your you know smartphone ebook readers are out there as well and that's just a mobile device that's used primarily for reading electronic books rather than having the traditional uh, paper books as you can see down there in the bottom left got an image of a wearable device um, a wearable device just like that it's wearable small mobile computing device designed to be worn for different functionality uh, wearable devices include activity tractors like a Fitbit smart watches like you see here uh, they will have different functionality checking your heart rate um, checking your movement to know how active you are be able to answer phone calls send text messages read text messages a portable wearable device that is a computing device and lastly as you can see up here I've got a gaming console and a gaming console is a mobile computing device designed for single player or multiplayer video games while you're on the go. Let's talk a little bit about data and there's a difference between data and information and data is just a collection of unprocessed items which can include text, numbers, images, audio and video. Now information is useful to us. Data is not useful information is. Information is going to convey meaning to us as users. Things like your name, your address, uh, what courses you might be taking, grades you've gotten, uh, these all represent data that's processed to generate like someone's typical semester grade who's in college. We have a lot of information, a lot of data there, but it's not really useful to us till we put it together and then it makes sense now we can use that information that's why it's now called information you know other information on someone's typical grade report could include like results of their GPA per semester as uh, as a whole for their term that they've been at the institution and the way we get this information this data that gets transformed into information or useful information uh, is through input devices now an input device is any hardware component that allows you to enter data and instructions into your computing device and I'll show you some examples of common input methods here in just a second and you'll probably recognize a lot of these I talked about one earlier and that's a keyboard a keyboard contains keys that you press you physically press to enter data and instructions into the computer or mobile device you use that keyboard your operating system receives that signal has all those ones and zeros and translates that into what key you pressed and so if you press the key for the letter K once it translates that and then and processes it through the central processing unit your output onto your screen is the letter K so there's a lot that goes on in the background but it takes the input the pressing of the letter K the, by you the user it processes that through the central processing unit and says okay I know what this string of data means and, and it needs to send an output to the monitor that says oh this person wants to see the letter K in the word processing software they're using and then we see the K on the screen some other input devices are a point a pointing device now a pointing device is an input device that allows you as the user to control a small symbol on the screen called the pointer and we typically are going to use a mouse for this you may have a stylus pen that you can use as well different pointing devices um, can be used to do that and you can change your mouse pointer that's on your screen to different little icons now some mobile devices and computers enable you to speak data instructions um, using voice input and to capture live full motion images using a video input so you can see here I've got a uh, webcam here on the bottom left so that allows to capture video this one actually has a mic on it as well so it allowed capture the audio here on the far right I've also got a microphone that I use and this allows us to capture that audio input as well now obviously this is an audio device or audio capture device anyway so we can't get any type of video through this because it's for audio data only. Now we also have uh, 
these type of digitizing devices that you see in the middle here to where I could if I want to write on my screen right on my display while I'm doing a video I can do that so I can I can draw I could just write this just makes a more interactive approach but that digitizer is going to take that input from the pen touching that screen and then translate that digitally to the output that will be on my monitor. Touchpads, we see all of these um, everywhere on a laptop. You can also buy touchpads that you can hook up to a device as well as a standalone device. So touchpads allow us to do those finger gestures that I mentioned earlier that create different types of input onto our uh, screens. As I said, we can speak instructions into a microphone or wireless headset and capture live video on a webcam for a video call. Here on the bottom right, I've got, or in the bottom, I've got a uh, Facebook portal device that allows us to capture motion and using the uh, camera there you see at the top. So we can share video, it's got a microphone, we can share audio, it's got speakers so we can hear audio that's coming in. I will see webcams on our phones, on our tablets, on our laptops. And sometimes we need to be a little bit more mobile and such as having a wireless headset that we use with your phone while you're driving so that you can speak wirelessly. You can also have devices built into your car as an add-on if your car stereo doesn't already have it built in to allow for uh, the Bluetoothing of your device to your speaker system in your car so that you can be hands-free while you're driving and have your eyes focused on the road. A lot of technology that allows us to share the audio and video with each other. Now output devices, once we get that input we and we the computer processes it, well, what does it need to do? It needs to put that information out there to whatever designated output device you've selected. Now remember that an input device is any hardware component that allows you to enter data and instructions into a computer or mobile device. I talked about some of those like the pointers and uh, scanners and uh, microphones, things like that. Our output is going to include things such as printers because printers, multifunction printers can be input or output because we can send images to the printer or we can send images out to the printer. Uh, our monitors, those are going to be our displays, those are common output devices. Speakers, earbuds, you can see I've got some pod ear pods up here on the top right. Bluetooth speakers are going to be another common output device. You, here in the bottom right I've shown you a 3D printer if we're going to use one of those. Um, now a printer is like I said it's just an output device that produces text and graphics on some type of physical medium usually going to be paper. Now with our 3D printer this is a little bit different and it can print solid objects such as clothing, uh, even prosthetics, toys, eyewear, parts for something that you're building and a lot, you know, a lot of these are used for making prototypes as someone is trying to develop a final product. But these 3D printers allow us to go from that flat surface paper to something that's more physical that we can hold and turn around and look at measure depth and see how they, the form and fit are going to affect the function. Now let's talk about memory and storage. We get our input, well we have to store that input whether temporarily or long term. And memory consists of electronic components that store instructions waiting to be executed and the data needed by those instructions. A computer keeps data, instructions, and information on different types of storage media. We have lots of different storage devices and these storage devices uh, record items to and from the or items to our devices as well as they retrieve or read information. So our storage devices are going to write data and they can, or they can have data written to them as well as they can read information. Up here in the top here I've got some RGB RAM. This is our random access memory. Anything that's stored on here is only there while there's power to the device. 
So if you're working on something and you lose power and there were any type of instructions here on the RAM, this is what's called volatile memory. So when we lose power, anything that's stored there, it's gone. Now these other devices, like you see uh, the hard drives, these physical hard drives are here in the top two pictures. These have, are almost like an old record player and you have spinning platters. You have an actuator arm that goes across back and forth reading the data. These devices are um, that non volatile memory. When you store something here, this is where like when you store a file, a picture, a document, that's where that information gets stored. Now we also have what's called a solid state drive as you see here on the top right next on top of the other uh, spinning hard disk drive there. Uh, information stored much different in ROM chips so it's more like the flash drive that you might have used here on the bottom left. Same type of technology, um, no moving parts so they're they're lighter, they're quieter, they use much less electricity and long term they're more reliable. We also have micro SD cards that you might put into cameras, uh, video cameras, digital cameras and then you can transfer those over to other devices to see what those images and videos were captured. Now the internet. This is what everyone knows, what everyone's connected to all the time. The internet provides billions of homes and business units around the world access to a variety of services that they don't have locally or may not be able to access very easily. Now the World Wide Web is one of the most widely used services of the internet. Now there's a difference between the web and the internet. The internet is a worldwide collection of computer networks that connect businesses, government agencies, educational institutions, and us as individuals. Many of our everyday devices and objects or internet connected things are equipped with sensors that transmit data to and from the internet um, and collectively when we have all these type of devices that are connected to the internet sharing this information this is a term you might have heard called the internet of things the internet of things is just that it's a bunch of devices that are connected to this big network called the internet through some type of media and the sharing of retrieval of information that's what we call the internet of things some uses of the internet that you have probably use or may not have used but they're there uh, some of these uses include uh, email, VoIP or voice over internet protocol, file transfer protocol, sharing of files over the internet, and instant messaging. The web consists of, I said that there's a difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. Now the World Wide Web consists of a worldwide collection of electronic documents. And each document on the web is called a web page. You've heard that term before. Well, that's what the World Wide Web is. It's a connection of all those pages. And then the internet is what we use to connect to those web pages. Now the services on the internet um, that we use, we use through different internet protocols and we use through accessing those web pages that are stored on a device somewhere we use whatever connection we have to the internet whether it's a fiber connection a DSL digital subscriber line connection our connection through our cellular network using our mobile devices or even satellite connection so there are lots of different ways that we can use these services on the internet now if you've ever been around someone when they don't have connection to the internet then you know that it creates chaos so when the internet is down a lot of people don't know how to react so we want to make sure that our devices are good and and our network people know what they're doing so we can know how to connect and use those services now we I mentioned earlier we can store our media on different types of storage devices here's another one an optical disc whether it's a CD DVD blu-ray disc they all have different um, capacities storage capacities to store a more modern version is to use cloud storage uh, you've probably heard the term cloud and a lot of us just will call the cloud the cloud because whenever we draw um, network diagrams we use a cloud for years we've done this to represent the internet but cloud storage is an internet service uh, and this internet service provides remote storage to users 
types of services that we see that are being offered by different cloud storage providers are going to vary. You can use uh, cloud storage. There are different cloud services we won't go into right here, but you're, if you've got a Google account, then you have a Google Drive, which is cloud storage. There's lots of pay for services that you use. If you've got an Apple device and you're using the iCloud, you've got uh, cloud storage there too. So if you are running out of room or you want to back up your data so you have another uh, copy of your data, you're going to use cloud storage. Some of the providers are going to provide storage for, for specific types of media, uh, such as your photos, where others might back up content. It, um, you might, you know, if you've used your Apple storage for cloud storage, then you've backed up probably your photos, your videos, and your music. Typically, when it comes to all of our information we have stored, we need to make sure that we're using a backup program to copy the contents of our hard drives or our storage drives to some type of separate device. Um, we, it's a terrible situation when you come across where someone's device has failed and they don't have any backups and there's no way to retrieve that data. Um, that can be very heartbreaking. So we need to make sure we regularly copy our music, our photo, our videos, our personal documents, and other important items to some type of external storage device, whether it's an external hard drive. You can buy the external cases that hook up through USB or Type-C connection, and then you can put the inf copy your information over, put that in a fireproof safe, and it's stored. You can use cloud storage as well. You can use flash drives. You can use optical media. There are lots of ways that you can back up your data so that you have it in case something happens to your main device. Um, apps for backing up your smartphone or your tablet computers um, is available as well. So you have lots of devices, you just need to look into it. Um, but, and most of your mobile device manufacturers provide some type of cloud storage solution. Now, when we get on the internet, what do we use? We use a browser. Now, a browser is software that we've installed or has been installed for us that enables users with that connection to the internet to access and view those web pages, that World Wide Web, on our device, our computing device. And when we use our browser, we also use something else called a search engine if we want to look for something. And a search engine is another type of software that finds the websites, uh, the web pages, the images, the videos, the maps, and other specific items related to a specific topic. Some of the more common um, web browsers that we use are shown right here. Internet Explorer, Firefox, Google Chrome, Safari, even Bing, so, oh, not Bing, sorry, Microsoft Edge. Um, Edge here on the far right, you see that icon, that was Microsoft's replacement for its other web browser there on the far left, Internet Explorer, um, but it, it hasn't completely taken over. But when we introduced Windows 10, the Edge browser was designed and put into the operating system for use to replace the old Internet Explorer. Here up on the top image here of my pseudo or my display of what a typical browser looks like, you see that you have browser tabs there. Um, with modern browsers, instead of opening up single instances of the browser, you have tabs that just kind of stack on one on top of each other like old file folders would in a uh, file cabinet so that we can easily just sift through them, click on them to use them. We have navigation buttons like the back button and the uh, refresh button. We have an address bar where if we want to go to you know, cengagebrain.com, we can type that in. If we want to go to google.com, we can type it in right there. If we want to go to espn.com, we go there. If we want to go to a government website like indiana.gov, we just type it all in. That's what the address bar is for. And then the lower area allows, that's where we're going to see our main display. And then we have our typical buttons for minimizing, maximizing, and closing there on the top right. Typically on the right side of that main bar, you're also going to have like your properties button so you can go through your history, uh, be able to clear your cache, clear your cookies, delete your browsing history. You'll find all that typically right there. 
Now I mentioned search engines and recall that search engines are software as well that finds the websites for us. Um, if we don't know what the actual address is and we want to do a search for something like golden retrievers then we can type that into the address bar um, of the actual search engine not our browser so we just type in some words and the search engine is going to use these web crawlers to go out and find all these sites and then rank them based on different analytics and then give us those results and then we have different parts you'll have the hyperlinks that are given you're given the addresses um, and then you're giving a description there of what the website has so lots lots and lots of search engines are available some of the more popular ones I've got displayed here uh, Bing which I accidentally mentioned earlier uh, DuckDuckGo Google is such a popular one that if you've never heard of Google uh, you haven't apparently this is your first time of touching a device Yahoo is another search engine MSN there are tons of search engines you're just going to use which one is your preference you see I've got Google up here that's my preference because it is so clean and easy to use online social networking uh, you've probably heard the term social networking there are um, we also hear the words called social networking sites but a social networking site or online social network is just a website or you know you might think of it as an app but the app is actually connecting to the site but this is just these encourage members in this vast online community to share things that you're interested in share ideas share stories share pictures sharing of videos with other people that are registered on that site as a user as well uh, an example is like with Facebook here now Facebook um, you share messages interests activities other things other types of personal information with other registered users and we call these posts and you post information and those family and friends that are connected to you those other users can see this information and then you can like pages of others other companies other products celebrities um, Twitter is another very popular social media social networking site um, with this you can follow people follow companies follow organizations in which you have some type of shared interest with so you can stay current with their information with their daily activities as they are uh, tweeting out different images videos information as well LinkedIn is another very popular one uh, this is more on the professional side so you can share those professional interests with uh, educators and potential employers your employment history and um, you can add colleagues or former colleagues um, to your contacts so that you have that professional networking for potential new jobs uh, staying current with people if you're an HR manager you're looking for people with the skills that you need to fulfill the jobs you have tumblr foursquare skype these are all very there's so many Pinterest is another one of the social networking sites so there are lots out there to go from but they all share the same characteristics and that you're sharing personal information and interest with others that are on those sites as well digital safety and security are very important you hear the term cybersecurity all the time generally speaking in very basic terms it is important to you as a user to protect your computers your mobile devices that all house your personal information or connection to your personal information some of the things you can come across are viruses malware such as ransomware which can take over your device encrypt your files and then you have to pay to unencrypt those files and you can look that up on your own there's a um, you need to be very cognizant of using your making sure your devices even your phones and a lot of people don't do this but putting anti-malware anti-spyware antivirus software on your mobile devices because it's a computing device it's connected to the internet you access your email you open up different files you don't want to lose all of your information and they can be uh, they can become infected as well you want to protect your privacy on the internet uh, there are some health concerns being on the internet all the time uh, there's some different terms we can talk about there uh, there are environmental issues as well when it comes to digital safety and security now the term that you may have not heard of is called green computing now green computing 
involves reducing electricity consumed and the environmental waste that's generated when we are using a computer or when we are done using a computer is really the big one when it comes to uh, waste that's generated. Um, some of the strategies that are involved with this green computing are obviously recycling, using more energy efficient hardware and energy saving features on our devices, uh, regulation of manufacturing processes, uh, overall extending the life of our computing devices, as well as immediately donating or properly disposing of those devices that we've replaced and making sure that those are disposed of properly, checking with your local regulations of how to dispose of e-waste. So you, you, know, you can donate these, but there are uh, places that when you take these computing devices, these old devices, they may take those and have an, send those to an organization that will break down the different components of that, take out the, the scrap metal, uh, take out the, be able to get the plastic extracted so that all of this information or all of these components can be broken down to their bare elements and then recycled for later use. Now a term I mentioned earlier that uh, we all use to be able to use our computers we have to have software installed and the main software is our operating system <laughs> but software um, this, you also heard this term before probably it's called uh, some people will use the term program or app or application so these are all the exact same thing but what they are is that they tell the computer what tasks to perform and then how to perform those tasks we have system software, we have operating systems, we have uh, various uh, functional tools that are all coded and then installed and then our computer, the processor, the CPU, the central processing unit interprets those instructions and carries out those instructions so that we have the input and the output that, that handles the processing. But a computer without an operating system is, is useless. So that's why our operating system, which is everything you see, everything you use, on your device there has to be an operating system and then everything you download uh, you know any applications you download if you download Microsoft Office use Office 365 if you're using uh, a music service whatever those are all programs or applications there's software that's been written and then the computer changes that high-level language into the machine language and executes whatever instructions it needs to execute. Now you said instructions because software consists of a series of related instructions that are organized for a common purpose for the, the deployment of that software and it tells the computer what tasks to perform, how to perform them, and it does it in the background so we don't have to. And our CPUs, our central processing units, can handle billions of instructions per cycle of the clock so billions of instructions per second so it can do so much for us that we can't do ourselves and it does it very fast and very efficient I mentioned operating systems earlier on this computer here I'm using a Microsoft Windows operating system if you're on a Mac you're using your Mac operating system or Mac OS if you have an iPhone you're using a mobile version of that called the Apple iOS um, if you're on like a a smartphone that's not an Apple you're probably using Google's Android or you may have a Windows phone that's using the Windows mobile operating system if you come across a server or if you're an enthusiast you might be using a Linux operating system so there are lots of different operating systems that are out there for us to be able to use there is a difference between our mobile applications and our desktop applications and a desktop app is an application that is stored on our computers. Now there's a web app too that we can use um, and a web app is an application that's stored on a web server that you can access through your browser. And if you're on your phone or whatever and you ha are using a mobile app or your tablet, a mobile app is an application that you download from a mobile device's app store such as like the Google Play Store and or some other location on the internet and you then use that on your mobile device. So there are apps for the Mac operating system and Windows operating systems for our uh, devices. Android and iOS operating systems also have apps that you can download and use as well. 
and you interact with these operating system interface by clicking or tapping the icons or the tiles on your user interface. Now, installing a program, this is that process we use for setting up a program to work with whatever computing device, whether it's a desktop computer or some type of mobile device. Once you've installed this program, you, run it, you can run the program so that you can interact with it. You interact with the program through its user interface, and that's what you actually see on your screen. The people that do this are called that create these programs for us or these applications for us and create that user interface that we see are called software developers. You might even hear the term called programmers. And those are the people who develop the programs or the applications. They write the instructions that direct the computer or our mobile device to process that data into useful information and allow us to have that user interface to be able to see like we see on the screen here with our Windows 10 computer in the top left. You can see all the functionality that's built in there or on our Mac device here on the right and we see we both have you know the icons that we can click on to be able to open something to be able to use it and to interface with it. Here's an example of what an app looks like or what a, the background of the it looks like for your program. As I said developers write the instructions um, here we're using Visual Basic to write those instructions and this is just to create a simple payroll application where we put in the person's name, we have how many hours they worked, what their hourly rate was, and we can calculate all right if they were on uh, the regular pay just based on 40 42 hours times 18 hours, that's how much they're getting paid. If, they're, if we've got some instructions set up for, oh, if they're over 40 hours, they get an overtime pay, how much is that going to be? And if they worked overtime, we would we would have to include that in and so we would have a total pay. All those instructions are written in here in to that type of code for whatever we're writing. If we're writing C++, if we're writing Visual Basic, if we're writing C Sharp, we're doing Python, they each have their own language and their own set of instructions. When you're jumping from language to language when you're a programmer, you just have to learn the syntax for that language to be able to do what you need to do. Now in the course of the day, it's likely you use or you know lots of different information that's generated by one or more different types of communication technologies. You're able to do this using some type of communication device. So whether you're using file transfer protocol, if you're live streaming, you know, using your mobile device, if you're using or accessing vo voicemail, if you're getting on the internet on your mobile device, you're using some type of communication device for those communication technologies. Now communication device, uh, this is just a hardware that's capable of transferring items from computing devices to transmission media and then receiving that as well. So you know your like your mobile phone is a communication device. We have lots of different communication technologies that we use we don't think much about such like video conferencing, instant messaging, and it's all being done through what's known as a communication device. We have lots of those. Some of those include modems. You probably have your wireless router at home, wireless access points. These are all examples of communication devices that enable our communication between our computers or mobile devices and the internet and then to be able to receive that. So the communication process is only good if you have the sender and the receiver and they both understand the message and then the, we get an acknowledgement, some type of feedback from the receiver. Notice that some computers and devices communicate via wires as you see here in our bottom right we've got a wire connected to our modem and some devices communicate wirelessly like most of these other devices they're connected to our access point there such as our, our phone, our tablet and our mobile device. Then all of those go through an internet service provider to be able to give us that connectivity to everything outside of our devices. So you could have different types of wire connections whether they're copper or whether they're even fiber optic which is using pulses of light. The medium that you've probably come across most are the wires and that's got a copper, uh, a lot of copper wires inside them 
single wire if you're using your coax for your cable modem. Fiber optics, completely different technology, much faster, uh, much more expensive, and then you also have cellular communication which goes through our radio towers. So I just mentioned the different types of communication technologies to remember are going to be Wi-Fi. This is what you use and don't even think about and if you lose it you're like oh no how am I supposed to connect. We also have Bluetooth um, especially in like a personal area network if you're using your Bluetooth headphones to connect wirelessly to your uh, mobile phone or media player then you have set up a personal area network a very small network between you and that between the two devices that have limitations uh, very small limitations to how far away from the devices can be so as an example if I'm using my Bluetooth headphones and I'm cycling or whatever and all of a sudden I don't hear my music then I I know that within 30 to 35 feet for clear line of sight I've dropped my mobile device and I should be able to pick I just need to trace my steps and do that. Now I said with PAN, a personal area network, very small, using like your NFC, your near field communication, using your phone to pay for things, um, you have to be very close proximity. That is a, you've set up a personal area network as well. We've also got cellular radio. Um, this is where we're receiving those signals for like our phone to have access uh, to the internet for our smartphones we are in proximity of some type of cellular tower somewhere some cellular radio tower and as we go from one tower to another they do a handoff process so that we don't lose communication with your devices you might set up a hotspot and a hotspot is just a wireless network that provides internet connection to mobile devices through a single device Wi-Fi hotspots provide wireless network connections to users in public locations such as airports and you know the air the uh, stations when you're waiting to get onto a train uh, maybe at a school hotel lots of hot spots that are around us I've said the word network before a network such as the internet I told you that's the largest network well a network in general is just a collection of computers and devices connected together often wirelessly um, via communication devices and transmission media. We have all kinds of hardware that are used when we're setting up our networks. Whether it's a business network, a home network, we have things such as those communication devices such as access points, routers, patch panels, switches, modems, firewalls. At home you don't see a lot of this. You typically have one device, you call it your home router, but it has some of these other functionalities built into them. It's an access point. That's how you communicate wirelessly to your devices. It's a, it can be as a router. It's going to route the information from your devices out to the internet and then receive information to from wherever your destination was. It's routing the packets of information for you. Uh, you can even set up your home routers to as a firewall to protect you from threats that are outside your network. We also use servers and a server manages the resources on a network and clients individuals access those resources through that server they share those resources let's go ahead and take a look at a basic home network home networks save the home user money and provide many conveniences allowing the users at the home to connect to the internet obviously at the same time to share a single high-speed connection to the internet to be able to access you know photos videos and other content on computers and devices throughout the house if you set up your home network you can share devices such as printers even though we have you know one printer there on the you know top floor I might be sitting outside using the zone outside to be able to print to that printer so this home network allows me to do that you just have to set them up correctly we can connect game consoles to the internet at home. We can do lots of things um, to be able to share data, access data, things like that. Our, our homes are becoming more and more dependent on an internet connection. I talked about the internet of things. So like here we've got smart TVs. Our smart TV which has lots of apps on it. If we want to access Netflix, then we need that internet connection. So we're going to go through our wireless router and from our TV whether we've got a wire connection or wirelessly and then that's going to give me an 
connection to the internet through my internet service provider to get to Netflix. It's gonna, Netflix is going to verify my account. Then when I select what I want to watch, that's going to show up on my TV through my internet connection. You know, we've got these Bluetooth speakers. We may have different speakers set up throughout the house. You know, here we've got three different speakers set up that we've got in party chain mode that we can listen to the same music in three different locations on individual speakers. You might have a smart speaker where this here is an, the uh, Echo Show that allows me through my internet connection to have video and audio going through here if I want to uh, conference you know a family member that also has one and we can talk and see each other through our internet connection on this device you might have surveillance cameras set up that are wireless or wired so home networks have gotten much more uh, every day and more complicated if we have a home theater set up and we've got a projector set up in a room and we've got wireless speakers and we're using our smart TV or a internet connection to broadcast from our tablet to the projector and then onto our display on the wall there's a lot that goes into that now business networks are a little bit different in that they facilitate communications they share hardware in the business they share data information and software and it's a much more complex network because we have a lot more devices um, that we use to facilitate those communications the hardware could be much more intricate we could have uh, switches and patch panels and servers where we won't have that at home and then when we're in that network we're going to share that data amongst each other someone can be on the first floor and upload information to a file server that's on the sixth floor that someone on the 20th floor accesses all from their location without having to go to the floor where the servers are at now there's different types of users that we can break down into who uses technology and why this information this network information needs to be shared and having that connection to the internet is necessary we have a home user this is our our typical person ourselves when we're at home we want to get access to the internet we want to use different types of technology and a home user is just any person who spends time using technology at their residence we also have a small home office user these are going to include employees of companies with much fewer than 50 employees as well as the self-employed person who just works from home as a proprietor self proprietor a small office home office user you might use what's a term called you might have heard maybe haven't called crowdsourcing and crowdsourcing is the practice of involving a large group of people that's why we call them the crowd and this crowd is going to collectively contribute their time their services maybe funds their knowledge and expertise as well as maybe some off-the-wall ideas they're going to share all that with you for some project some cause or some goal many of these crowdsourcing activities today are organized and promoted via online social networking media like I said like with Twitter and Facebook and we're bringing our world that's so vast much closer together when we're crowdsourcing to help get the solution for something we also have mobile users a lot of us are mobile users and this includes any person who works with computers or mobile devices who are away from a main office away from their home away from school away from their network but they still need to do things these are our mobile users and then we have our power users our power user is just a user who requires the capabilities of a very powerful computer needs admin access higher privileges to their devices and on their networks and then enterprise user this is our last type of user we'll talk about here in our discussion on you know all these using today's technologies uh, this is what's known as the enterprise user and an enterprise is going to have hundreds or thousands of employees or customers who work and do business with offices across the world across the country across your city each employee or customer who uses computers mobile devices and other technology in that enterprise they are an enterprise user they are going to access the data with each other share the data work with each other 
use that network in that enterprise, they're an enterprise user. As I said, there are so many different technologies that are out there today. We've talked about a lot of them, uh, but it's good to have an understanding of those technologies and where we're at and where we'll be. Uh, some of these technologies may be new, um, so maybe something interests you that you will now go beyond here and research some of those that interest you. Maybe you don't have a smart speaker and you're like, oh, I've heard about those. I've heard about Alexa. I've heard about you know the Google devices. Maybe I want to research a little bit more and go check them out. I hope this information uh, was helpful to you and that now maybe you have a starting point to go find out more. Have fun with today's technologies and in getting used to the technologies and devices that have yet to be shared with us. Because with everything else in technology, it changes very rapidly. Take care, everyone.